dead. On here. All right. Everybody, I'm Lee and I'm here with Thomas Strachan, who will be presenting a salon discussion next month, March 8th at 5 p.m. And there's tickets are on sale and there's only five, 15 left. Yeah, 15 left. So make sure you grab some. And today we're going to be having a con uh, conversation around pleasure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So last week we talked about the beautiful as a personal preference or perhaps as Plato suggested something else. Um, today, this discussion, this kind of meditation is going to be about another very common understanding about beauty, which is it's pleasure, right? We get a, we get a pleasure from seeing these that are beautiful, right? Yeah. It's a very natural feeling, instinct. So that in Plato does address that in Greater Hippias. So the dialogue we'll be discussing, reviewing on March 8th, will go over the one that means you're important understanding their beauty. And I think in particular, we tend to think just like personal preference, right? They kind of like him. We like ice cream flavors. We like mountains. We like beautiful bodies, right? Um, beauty with pleasure does seem related in a lot of ways, well, right? I definitely receive pleasure from looking at beautiful things and from being around beautiful people and beautiful experiences. Um, I'm very much so a pleasure seeker. Yeah. Um, I, my, but pleasure is my purpose. I feel like in this lifetime, um, I actually used to work at a, uh, adult entertainment store and I have this sweater I wear all the time that says, uh, your pleasure is our business. And I always get compliments on it. Uh, and I feel as, as though without beauty or the concept of beauty, then my life would not be as pleasurable. <laughs> so. You know, there's a long tradition in philosophy called hedonism, right? With a that's very much a question the saying that the good is the also that thing with goodness, right? It's pleasure, right? I think good things are pleasurable too. Mm -hmm. So that's actually a really interesting uh long tradition of that, of that kind of interpretation or investigation of pleasure seems seems something very important to us. Right? Uh -huh. uh, so I do think that's an important area to consider, I think about. Um because also because it, it's kind of interesting the idea of there's different kinds of pleasures. Right. Too sad. Yes. Too sad. Sad. Um you know, there's obviously that. I mean, probably the strongest distinction that everyone probably think of, you report in the adult industry, an entertainment is basically sexual pleasure. Mm -hmm. um, that term is eros in Greek, right? kind of ero erotic, right? Comes from that same form. Um, that is absolutely part of the equation. That it has to be. It's part of the discussion, um, right? Is it's the mending of that erotic pleasure with also the other kinds of pleasures, right? Some say they're all the same in the end, <laughs> uh, but. Hedonism or study of it does discuss those kind of questions in the first place. Um, and in the dialogue, I'm not going to tip off too much what we're going to discuss there, but uh, there is a long discussion about those points, specifically with sexual intercourse actually being a uh, nature of the pleasurable. And actually, you know, kind of a, a very common thread that's in that dialogue, gets touched a couple times, is social convention. Mainly because it talks about how. Some players we what we want to do private versus doing in public. Mm. So like there's kind of like a almost um, voyeurism kind of discussion or dynamic in play going on there. Well, that's interesting because when we think about where we are today as a society, so much of our pleasure I feel like can be received from being online. Like some things that pop in my head are uh, like. Japanese foods, how they make them so cute and like you want to eat it. It looks so beautiful that you would think that it's pleasurable just from looking at it on the screen. You're receiving this sense of pleasure of like, wow, that's a really beautiful cupcake, you know? Uh, and there is a lot of uh, showcasing our lives and the pleasure within our lives for other people to receive nowadays from the internet um, and kind of people living vicariously through others in those ways. I know, hey, that's what I'm saying. I'm more the voyeurism exactly for that reason. We have this really inter kind of parasocial dynamics, right, where we have a relationship with people online, let alone just like we just watch enjoying things just to observe them. I'm totally guilty of it, too. <laughs> like, I love watching cooking videos where I just watch the cooking be done. I don't have to eat the food, I just enjoy watching the food being made. It's so uh, absolutely, plus just like cute things, too. Just like you just like seeing cute things existing and make being made. Uh, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I understand. Yeah, pleasure is. Pleasure is very interesting because we're also in this like state where we can have perhaps too much pleasure. That I feel like that's a, like that's hot, hot, like hot topic. Yeah, 
And uh, the internet is also kind of guilty of supporting this type of dynamic where, you know, we get these dopamine rushes, huge dopamine rushes from the amount of like beautiful, pleasurable things um, that we see online and like what is the fine line of like overindulging and, you know, and just appreciation in those things. That is definitely, if it was a hallmark of the modern era, it is absolutely that kind of oversaturation, right? It seems like everything can be done in excess. Um, that's why Plato's discussion about beautiful, the, the beautiful being a definite excess is really interesting language. That's also used sometimes in Lacanian or Fordian language and psychology about a kind of excess when we have this kind of overwhelm. Um, and sometimes that's the thing. It's like things that are actually even just natural things like noises or blights, for example. If they're too overwhelming, we actually get, we get pain from it. So what gives us pleasure at one point actually causes pain. Maybe BDSM energy is going on right there a little bit. Um, but that is also an interesting aspect too, because that's also one of the challenges that's made in the dialogue uh, is that sometimes the beautiful actually challenges us. It actually, there's, it gets termed differently as all later. Um, this kind of or sublimeness where it's like an overwhelm that occurs that is actually slightly intimidating and actually could be scary and uh, kind of challenging, right? Yeah. Um, so that's where it even when we start pressing on that, it does seem like pleasure and beauty seem to co correlate, but yet there's a couple of noble notes there. It doesn't seem like it doesn't capture the full story. Yeah. Or they might by overwhelm, right? Yeah, things that are one way could be something very really different. I think about that as being like a modern creative and having access to seeing so much beauty out there and that how that, you know, the challenging versus, you know, inundation kind of that of like, wow, someone's doing something great. I like I can do that. I want to do that. I can do something similar. I can build that. Look at it as inspiration or wow, they're doing something beautiful. I wish I can do that. I don't know if I'll ever get there, you know, it's like there's kind of like that duality that we experience from the like witness of all the pleasures of life right now. The, that the concept of what's called mesis or mimicking. So the word mimicking comes from that term. Um, that kind of, I want to be like that person. So imitation. Mm -hmm. And actually there's a long tradition um, in Aristotelian ethics that way, the way we become good people is by reproducing other good people. So that kind of inspirational role model energy uh, is absolutely in play there, right? Mm -hmm. And that's and there's actually lots of literature and philosophy talking about well, medic, what's called mimetic desire, right? So the idea of 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 other of beloved having something that you wish to have. Mm -hmm. So because that suggests one of the interesting kind of plays, um, it's hinted at slightly in greater hippies, but more in other dialogues from Plato. Plato, the idea of desiring of the good, right, of a possessional kind of taking. Versus a kind of beholding joy. And what I mean by that is a lot of the, the mode of pleasure in the modern world is consumatory. My nature. Either consumed by voyeurism or consumption by purchase and in taking into the body. But a kind of taking. Versus, uh, it doesn't seem like when you watch a sunset, you're not really consuming it. Not like watching a video of a sunset would be an act of consumption. And because the sunset, it, it, it's literally overly excessive. It's like you're, and more importantly, you're partaking in it. That's kind of the idea, the difference of a consumptional taking versus a kind of participatory onlooking or beholding. Um, the term for that is joy. So one of the nuances, it's actually used explicitly in Plato's, in this greater hippie style, that it's the beautiful what gives us joy. It gets converted from pleasure to be a joy, which is a very incredibly subtle point because it's about that line of access and possession and, and kind of participating. And, um, but what are your thoughts about that? Uh, I was thinking about the concept of presence. Like when you were talking about the sunset and like the difference for me between watching a video of a sunset is I'm not present yeah. to it. I'm just, you know, I'm just like, oh, wow, that's pretty. That's beautiful. I'm glad they put, they, they put yep. it on it. And this, I felt, you know, but when I'm watching a sunset, I went, wow, this is, I'm in awe. You know, it's breathtaking. The cotton candy clouds of it. You forget about the pollution for a second. <laughs> You're just like, wow, this is so beautiful. And you know, like for me, like 
presence is a large part of like the joy, you know? And I was also thinking how, how do we really know the differentiations between like pleasure to joy to awe? It seems like this kind of like circular. Yeah. Very good metaphor to talk about it. A lot of the uh, parts of the a dialogue sal salon is to circumscribe, right? We're not going to get to the core of the thing. We're going to go around and kind of circle around these kind of questions. Because these are very, these are exactly the kind of questions they have to answer about how we live our lives. Because that note about the screen exchanger facing of it, of the sunset versus in person one, I think you did a great job summarizing that point, that presence. Because the screen is just an image. An image does not have presence. Actually, except for, I would make a qualification, the like best of arts can do that, right? Actually, that's almost the side of a great piece of painting or digital or digital or kind of image. It has a presence to it. Yeah. Uh, it achieves that. So it's not like images cannot do it. It's just that that's the quality. Right. What is that quality? What is that presence? That's the, it's almost a, like it's, it has a being or lights or or a kind of effervescentness about it. Yeah, it's what's coming to mind for me is like an intention, an intention from the artist to provoke those type of responses yeah. via their art versus just posting. You know, like it, you, you can still post, like I could take a photo of one of the pieces in here and just post it. And it might not be the same as like when I take an intentional photo of it, like at a certain angle with the intent for you to notice this one thing within the painting or maybe something else. Uh, and we can frame up the, we can frame up our imagery to provoke that type of response versus just be like, oh, this looks beautiful. Here's a photo of my food. <laughs> and what you're pointing out there is that kind of intentionality it's a kind of intelligibility so it's noticeable it's something that comes that you become aware of that some rational agent did something and you could perceive that wow. which was a very interesting point about are you telling me the sunset is basically having that same nature has that same effect yeah there you go so i guess that's um universal intelligence you know that'd be one way to interpret it <laughs> um you know, and I, I just say that because actually as, a, you know, as an educator, you know, for, I, for we didn't bring up the intros, right? But the whole idea is that I'm a lecturer at, Uni at University of North Georgia at Ishing Design. And when I teach, when I work with students, that is exactly what I'm looking for. I, every student, every project, we know when there's intentionality. And that intentionality is obvious in the work. And the pull, the push of the of educator is trying to draw students to do that. And... It's funny because that's that kind of metaphor of like wh whatever snap versus intention that requires a kind of a tune of the body. You have to be aware. You have to be kind of like committed to draw out that work, to do that intention to it. And that is a kind of not headiness. You're not like in your head, bro. Like you're not just up here. It's like in the body. You have to get inside that. Mm -hmm. um, they kind of have that drawing commitment to work that way. Okay. Okay. I was uh, listening. I I was listening to a video last night uh, and uh, the drummer from Red Hot Chili Peppers and a couple other people were talking about Jay Dilla, which was a hip hop producer. Uh, and he is, his birthday was yesterday, so people were posting about it. Um, well, he passed away. <laughs> but he's still, one of the, he's still one of the greatest. And in the, in the video, he grabs one of his albums and he says, like, I listened to this album while I was just walking through the woods and it made me feel something. And there's a certain artist out there that can make you feel something mm -hmm. and to me when i'm looking at something that's beautiful something that's pleasurable like i have it invokes a response for me where i'm like wow you know and it can be something as simple as a line and for some reason that one line is just like i'm so awestruck by it resonates and you know i walk into a lot of galleries and sometimes they're like wow this is pretty this is this is pretty but it, and then i'll find one piece that's among the and i'm like this right here I feel so much from this, you know, and like that intentionality within the piece is really what provokes me to like sit there and stare at it for so long and just like be present with it. It's really both part, right? And the intentionality in the work that's in that, but that's in that straight, right? That is all, I mean, you want to talk about what is the, what is the highest aim for every artist is to achieve that, right? Uh, in all mediums of disciplines of art is to achieve what you're writing up. Um, but it also requires an attunement of the person. That's why I said reson I say resonance, because resonance requires an object that resonates with the frequency of the object that it responds to. Mm -hmm. um, and Plato, it's hinted slightly in this dialogue, but in his other ones, again, he talks more about it. 
his biggest mo his argument for all his argumentation for what he does in the dialogues is based on the immortal soul. I mean, which is surprising. Most people wouldn't think that's actually the most important part of his argument, but it is. Uh, and the reason why is he's setting the argument up that we need a beautiful soul to resonate with beauty in the first place. I mean, so with these points about walking in nature, resonating with certain shapes, listening to certain music, resonating with it, it's a... We kind of hinted a slightly last week with the with this discussion of what could be beauty that's, that's beyond, that includes personal preference but goes beyond it. This is what we're getting at. This idea of a kind of resonance of your soul with these beautiful things. So there's signs. So when you resonate with beauty, it's actually a sign of your soul being beautiful in the first place. Mm -hmm. Because you wouldn't be able to perceive it otherwise. Say like a thermometer that's not working or working, right? <laughs> if the thermometer doesn't work, especially a digital one, but our Murphy, the Murphy wasn't there. It doesn't respond. Doesn't does not resonate with the molecule with yeah. the temperature change. Um, we could treat our we could treat our souls, which have a relation with our bodies clearly. Uh, when our bodies respond and resonate and kind of strike with that piece, it, this is a moment of pleasure, right? And the rain wants kind of pleasure because it's both a kind of consumption. It has that element of drawing and strike and arrows of drive, but yet it doesn't have that consummatory nature. It doesn't, like in terms of the consumption taking kind of attitude. The banging actually more, it's more of a self affirmant of yourself. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of people are present to that type of witnessing you know they're looking at it so externally that they're not realizing that they you know what is without or external from them is also internal into them so i thought that was a really nice point of the immortal soul like i haven't heard that uh phrase yet i actually have not read the hippie greater hippies yeah so i'm really excited to read it and i hope you all are as well and to at least hear the discussion um so like to hear that these concepts were are you know from a time when I, in which I wasn't alive, but these concepts of beauty, of presence of the immortal soul and the importance of that within society um, and hearing about uh, Plato discuss this and, to, and how it is still a framework in which is important today and perhaps uh, could be better, or like there could be an increased awareness around this concept, you know? Uh, <laughs> I think it, it, it has a lot of, there's a lot of value going back to study these classics. Um, again, the reason why I love Plato is because it's, he's really perfect for our contemporary time because he doesn't give us an answer, especially his early dialogues. His earlier ones, he does not he purposely does not give us answers. He only sets up questions for us. But these are the most important questions because the answers to them really can dictate how we shape our lives. Like I think a lot of discussion of empathy or having a more intimate relationship requires a, another appreciation of beauty. Because that's kind of the point when you when you discuss these people go when you see people go to art and just see it as an other a just outside thing over there, and not realizing that it's also a relationship with yourself at the same time. That's a that's a kind of understanding of deeper intimacy with one with yourself, let alone with other people, and, uh, right? And a deeper intimacy with the world at large. You know, lacking uh, kind of removing that barrier of separation. Uh, and allowing people to really be more involved with the world around them. I think that's a re really poignant point. You know? And I think actually just draw, I mean, one of the reasons why also beauty is so important, I, in my, my reading of Plato, is what you brought up before slightly about basically mimicry, mimetic desire. That drive to want to be someone else. That's interesting because that requires you to be other. So it's an interesting moment of like, well, there's actually... Um, you know, in later traditions uh, in Catholic thought, so Aquinas talks about this, um, there's different modes of love. So there's what's there called first the piercing love, the one that actually breaks the self. It actually pierces through you and strikes through you to make you understand as an external world outside yourself. Then there's the, the ecstasy, which is like kind of drawing out that you want to go towards that beloved. And then there's a really interesting one, liquefaction. Which is that idea of that step, the breaking of the self to fill into the volume, into the beloved. Okay. So this idea related to inspiration, it's the idea of finding a thing that you find beloved, nature, an axe, a virtue, performance, and you feeling of, I want to be that. That's actually a really important from an education point of view. That's completely different from a, here's the checkbox, did you do the metrics, how many hours, four hours did you do? I teach, in, I teach in academia, so that's what we have to deal with. But I'm very aware that that's not 
that's a certain utility value of education, but that's not necessarily what Plato would argue education is. It's actually much more talking about kind of ecstatic love. And this kind of, and thus the mode of knowing is very much dependent on the mode of loving, mm. which is really fascinating. That's intriguing. I really, I've never heard that. Like the, usually for me, it's been a separation between logic and love, right? You know, and this here, like, you know, the love, the logic and logic of love is like one in the intertwined and like to really go throughout life you know, and to utilize the knowledge and the wisdom to have is involves like being present with love and the beauty. That's a, for me, a revolutionary topic to where we are now in society. Yeah, that's my point. This is, this is why it's going back, I guess from Aquinas, 13th century, 12th century, Dominican friar, uh, Plato, we're dealing with, what's it, 200, no, 100 BC, something like that period. These are thousands of years old, uh, but yet, the implications of actually, this is what they thought, with some interpretations, well, like ranting, and, um, but not that much. Really, you read the stuff, you realize, no, they're actually saying this. You realize we've gone in a completely different direction. Sometimes it's worth going back to reconsider things. Mm-hmm. Because, yes, I'll, I'll say this, um, with Aquinas, especially, there's a discussion of the fear of the Lord. Which is obviously, it's really interesting. We know it as like a very negative term. And it's, and it is acknowledged that in one mode of it, it's the fear of being punished, right? That easily you're going to be punished for some things you've done wrong, you know? But then there's a different, he says, no, but there's more. There's actually a more perfect form of it, which is, uh, it's filial love. It's, it's a mode of love in the sense of the thought of doing some, of harming your beloved will be so devastating to yourself. You would never even think to do it. I mean, that's what he said to fear of the Lord is in its full form. Which is bad. Yeah. Also in Islam, there's also a a similar dictum. So there's what's considered uh, Islam, Imam, and Asan. So those are levels of basically religious relationship. The lowest level is just following the law, right? And then there's Imam, which is a little bit more of a deeper relationship of following the mandates required. But then Asan is, the language is literally be in the presence of him as if he's right in front of you. And if you cannot do that, at least imagine that. What he's what they're getting at is that basically both the two traditions are saying exactly the same thing. That the hot this mode of devotion to the to God is very much a relationship of love in a sense of like my husband or wife. How could I, I would never hurt them, never willingly hurt them. And in fact, the act of accidentally hurting them would be devastating. It's just like how could I do that? So it so it's kind of a it, it's a that's what I meant by knowing and loving, kind of a. I mean, your, your, your love for this other is so powerful. How could I, I would convict myself in doing error and I want to correct myself to be better. So it's really has this really powerful dynamics of consent, of love and of knowledge and cultivation kind of all put together. Uh, what came up to me is uh, the kind of like classic of like being kind to your neighbor and treating them how you would treat yourself. You know, like those are the to- kind of topics that uh, popped up for me and how one can look at that from uh, like, oh, if I do something bad, then I'm going to be punished, you know, but then there's the, like the self, the self confliction of it, of like, I don't want to hurt this person because I don't want to hurt myself. I wouldn't want someone to treat me that way while I treat them that way. Mm-hmm. And like, I love myself enough to not, like love this person and to not harm them. Um, and those kind of like the simplicity of those topics and conversations. And, and you know, it's funny because we talked before about the art piece or piece of nature that you're in a relationship with. And one of the strike, one of the striking differences of when you're in a mode of love, you have a receptivity to it. I mm-hmm. mean, you, you're pierced by it and you're resonating with it as you're seeing it. A human being is probably their traditions. They generally say human beings are the it's in the classical mode, the highest level of being. And the reason why is because they are a, what's called a gemstone of reality. Mm. Because think about it, human beings have individuated souls that are a multiplicity of possibility. That as opposed to a piece of painting, it's just what it is. It's locked it. It ain't going to be anything else but that. Yes, there's a resonance that can happen and you changing can change the relationship to it. That's true. But a human being is like this absolute kaleidoscope of possibility. Uh, you, just, you did say you changing will change the like how you view the piece, not the piece changing, and then you and you viewing it changes. That's assuming a static painting, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to accept. Oh, yeah. <laughs>
you know, this is it, it, that's it's, it's a feedback loop mechanism, right? Yeah. That the resonance and change in you would have a re respond a, a resignation a response to the other person, and then this can feedback off each other. Sometimes in very negative ways, right? That can go very bad very quickly, but it also can go in the positive direction too. That's why human beings are so fascinating in relations with other human beings. Yeah. That resonance can be so much higher in possibility, well, danger, but also possibility. Um, that comes with life, you know. Comes with life. Right, and does in that, and beauty does require like to what we're, where we're talking. It's very easy to in a modern era to be very shut down because of overstimulation, consumption, things like that. It's very difficult to have intimacy because it requires courage. It requires the courage to be willing to open up in the first place, and even just asking the taking the time to ask the question, you know, what is my relationship with the beautiful? You mean using that as a metric of standard of how you want to live your life. It's a very different orientation. I think a lot of, actually related to that painting relationship. I mean, is any external experience, measure, putting against the measure of this is beautiful. It's very fast, like yelling at someone on the traffic, to the traffic jam. Or just saying you're beautiful. One of the that your interaction, like you yelling at that person. Oh, is that you? Oh, no. <laughs> say no. It's a very, that's so, this is where these kind of relationships of love and knowledge kind of interrelate with each other and have interesting applications. Oh, no. um, Okay. Was well, there anything else you want to say today, Thomas? I was on a rip. I'm kind of a reference. Or if was, also, you know, but obviously, the, I want to be just very clear. If you're watching this still, um, you know that the salon, um, you know, I'm just kind of sharing through my thoughts and meditations on reading these dialogues. But the point is, it's for you to experience it. So the idea is that we're going to be having these four segments of part of the dialogue that I isolated out. We're going to read it and listen to it together. I'll provide a summary about what that was roughly going on there. Then it'll be all going up to the floor, to up to 25 attendees so they can it will make it uh, to reflect, affirm, question, or challenge what was said. And just like how me and Luther here were having this exchange right now, kind of has a med, we just ripping all my like, funny <laughs> and out of that, some interesting insights came from that, uh, from our individual perspectives. You know, we'll be, doing, we'll be doing that similar proceeding in the salon session. And then my job is to summarize. So be, I'm leaving a lot of my meditations and thoughts right now, but that's not what's going to happen at the, at the session. Um, after we're done with that, with that summary, we'll then move forward to the next piece of dialogue. So ideally, like, we'll be kind of, you should be walking out with a really stimulated mind with a lot of possibility of thinking. Like, I didn't even think of it that way. Well, that's really interesting. You get to chew on that, right? You kind of have this opportunity to have these spaces to really chew and think on very deep questions like this. That's what I'm really excited about. I'm pretty excited about that too. Kind of, the, it feels like a lot of change and transformation that can occur between uh, the resonance of the space itself and the people within the space, and how we can all uh, kind of question our own perspectives uh, and enhance our perspectives on the beautiful together as a collective. I agree. Yeah. So, if you're excited about this discussion, it is going to be on March 8th, 5 p.m., and there's only 10 tickets left. And I would grab mine sooner than later. So thank you for being here. I'll be that. Peace. That was nice. And today, how do I exit out of here?